in reporting on an industry peak oil task force report for, prepared for the UK government, uh, the Wall Street Journal said, a shortage of oil could be a real problem for the world within a fairly short period of time. And by fairly short period of time, they're really talking about the next five years. Are we prepared for the peak of world oil production? Far from it. Uh, we depend on oil for over 95% of our transport energy. We depend on it for agriculture. We depend on it for the, our chemicals industry. We have no plan B at present for a world in which oil is scarce and expensive. Now, more expensive oil in some ways sounds like a good thing if you're sitting on a pile of it, as, as we are right now here in Alberta. However, as we saw over the last 18 months, when the price of oil goes up, economic activity starts to stall out. The airline industry starts to contract, the trucking industry, farmers start finding it difficult to pay for fertilizer. All of these impacts, knock-on effects, start to come to bear when oil prices go too high. Then, when economic activity starts to stall out because of high oil prices, that means that demand for oil recedes as a result of that, and then oil prices fall, perhaps to a level where we saw just last uh, December two, uh, 2009, oil prices, or excuse me, December 2008, oil prices went down to $32 a barrel, a level so low that investments in the tar sands no longer made any sense, or in future oil production capacity in anywhere, basically, Brazil, uh, Gulf of Guinea, off of Africa, uh, invest uh, something like $150 billion of an upstream investment in the oil industry was canceled because of low oil prices. So, so as, as cheap, easy oil depletes, we find ourselves in a no-win situation. Whether prices go up or prices go down, the economy suffers. But it's not just oil, because oil is not the only non-renewable resource we depend upon. Exactly the situation that we're finding ourselves in was forecast over 30 years ago in the first computer modeling study of resources, population, and sustainability called the Limits to Growth. Now this was, as it turned out, the best-selling environmental book ever published. And it, it was a very uncomfortable idea for many economists, particularly free market economists, the idea that there even were limits to growth. And so over the course of the next couple of decades, there were a number of prominent efforts in The Economist magazine and Wall Street Journal to uh, attempt to debunk the idea of limits to growth. Uh, but going back to those critical articles and seeing what, what the authors were actually doing, they were, they were merely taking a few uh, numbers out of this report, taking them out of context, and attempting to show that, that, uh, that forecasts were not being met. Better, more comprehensive studies since 1972 have repeatedly shown that the scenarios outlined in the limits to growth in 72 were basically correct, that world population, resources, uh, and economic activity are staying pretty much within the bounds of the scenarios outlined over 30 years ago. The scary part, of course, is that these computer models tended to show a collapse of industrial production, food production, and eventually population beginning around 2010. As I said, it's not only fossil fuels that we're talking about. Other depleting resources include everything from antimony to zinc. Uh, to different degrees, at different rates. These just happen to be a, a few uh, non-renewable resources that are important to the computer industry and to the renewable energy industry also, quite frankly. Batteries for electric cars, LCD computer screens, and, and many more things are dependent on fairly rare and rapidly depleting non-renewable resources. And then, of course, in the process of using fossil fuels, we're changing Earth's climate, uh, resulting in a situation where sustainability is threatened from a, a different direction altogether. Now, was the 
the economic recession that began in 2008 a result of peak oil? Possibly, at least to a certain extent. When the oil price shot up to 147 US dollars per barrel in July uh, 2008, we saw the airline industry contracting, the trucking industry, all, all of the impacts that I've already mentioned. In addition, we saw uh, property values beginning to decline, specifically in areas where people had long commutes to where they were living. Those were the places where property values started dropping first and fastest. So I think the argument can be made that uh, peak oil wasn't the, the, the sole and sufficient cause of the economic crisis. There was, in effect, a house of cards waiting to fall, overvalued real estate, uh, questionable uh, financial practices, and so on. But high oil prices lit the fuse that started the bonfire. Have we seen a real recovery yet? Uh, in the US, I would argue not. Although the, the press is arguing that we're in, we're in a recovery, uh, unemployment has started possibly to hit bottom and maybe even turn around, the reality is that we're still seeing declining tax revenues in all of the states. There are more mortgage resets coming. I believe that the federal government is going to be forced to write more stimulus checks on the order of hundreds of billions of dollars. So we're still in the woods. Uh, there's the argument that China is going to be able to bail out the rest of the world by keeping its growth engine running, but th that seems also questionable. I s spoke earlier about the rate of, of growth in China and the fact that, that all of that growth is really dependent on coal. 80% uh, of China's electricity coming from coal, a statistic similar to what is true also of, of Alberta. And we hear constantly the, that the world has 200 years worth of coal or 150 years worth of coal. But in, in fact, um, that, that kind of framing of the supply situation tends to be very misleading. After all, uh, when the very first assessment of U.S. coal reserves was made in 1907, that assessment was that the United States had 5,000 years worth of coal. Now, according to the most recent assessment, the U.S. back in the 1970s, which is already pretty old, the U.S. has 270 years worth of coal. So now we've, we've gone from 5,000 to 270 over the course of less than a century. Same thing happened in Britain. First assessment, 1865, Britain had 900 years worth of coal. Today, Britain's coal industry is virtually gone, only 150 years later. What, where's all of this coal going? Well, it turns out that we're, we're, we're not properly assessing the resource. The reality is that there's still a lot of coal in the ground in Britain, but it just isn't economic to extract. The same thing is going to be true in Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, and Wyoming, and Alberta. It's never economic to extract all of the resource, and we always follow the best first or low-hanging fruit principle of resource extraction. We identify and we extract the highest quality, cheapest, easiest to access resource first, and we leave the dirty, hard, expensive stuff for later. And guess what? It's later, and we're getting now to the lower quality resources and therefore prices of fossil fuels, not just of oil but also natural gas and coal, are increasing and will continue to increase. Again, looking at the uh, U.S. economy, this is uh, the blue line that you see is uh, the M3 money supply, the largest measure of money supply. Even though the U.S. federal government is borrowing enormous sums of money into existence to, to uh, bail out banks and to provide uh, stimulus to the economy, the reality is that the money supply is shrinking. So where is all of that money going? Well, it's disappearing, in effect. 